Good morning, church. Good seeing you all today. Hey, we're doing things a little differently. You need to stand first. Everybody stand. As you stand, make sure you have your bulletin in your hand. We have some exciting things coming up, and I wanted to show you right in the middle panel of your bulletin. First of all, Easter is coming. He is risen, and he is risen indeed. We are in the midst of sending out about 2,000 postcards to North Albany residents, and we have a couple hundred extra, and that's where you come in. Next week, we'll have those extras if you want to pass them out to friends and colleagues and neighbors. We want to fill this place not just once, but twice, as we're excited to offer two services coming up very quickly in the next few weeks, so be reminded of that. First of all, we want to clean up the joint. March 27th, that's where you come in as well. Make sure you see that. All church cleanup, March 27th, we're going to throw lunch at you. So make sure you're reminded of that date. Uh, five days of prayer will come right after that. And then Easter services. Uh, we plan on continuing some of those spring ministries with prayer and praise service. We want to invite you out for that on a Wednesday. And then um, we're going to see if we can find some fish over here at Waverly Lake. Sound good so far? Hey, some of our summer ministries are excited to make sure you get on your calendar. We have moved Vacation Bible School back a few weeks. Make sure you note that date, July 6th through the 9th. Sports Camp, where we'll offer our community basketball and soccer. We're excited to offer that, and we're going to do it. Uh, our trap shoot's still on. And then we're going to run out to uh, a new family camp location, and we're excited to offer that for the weekend for you diehard camper people, as well as those that want to drag their trailer over, and then we're going to have a Sunday service there. Sound like good news? Yes. It's encouraging. I saw a certain buzz today. I think we're, we're excited to not just wait, but waiting expectantly, yes, but ready for God to show up really soon in terms of opening up everything. Wouldn't that be cool? Let's do that. Hey, let's, as we're standing, let's pray. God, we, we pause because we thank you that you are God, that you are in full control of our lives. Lord, we have things on a paper, we have dates, we have things we're headed into, but God, we want to put it into um, kind of your driver's seat, if you will, Lord, by your spirit. And so, Father, whatever we come into service with, maybe our hearts are heavy, maybe we are waiting expectantly, we're still unsure. God, help us to lay those things down, maybe our to-do list or the things that uh, we are contemplating. And just discover you today, Father. Help us to be other-centered as we worship. In your son's name, amen. amen. We have a full band today. Thank you, Paul. Let's do it.
is greater, your love is stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater, your love is stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater, your love is stronger. cool to clap. It's all good. God likes it. <laughs> a lot. We've got a couple new songs for you. I don't know. I'm going to listen to you. Does that sound okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, we've got some songs, so you guys can sit down and stand up. I'm going to pour and pray. Just want to make sure you guys take this time to really reflect on your heart and um, what the Lord is at in your life right now. And uh, whatever's going on, this be a moment of prayer, praise God, like just give it to the Lord. Um, can I just be honest with you guys right now? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm struggling. I'm struggling. I just can't. Mm, like, there's something going on right now. It's just. Mm. And um, I'm just praying, Lord, just take this away from me. Just let me just worship you.
down and scream it from the mountains. Go on and tell it to the masses that he is God. Shout it. Go on and scream it from the mountains. Go on and tell it to the masses that he is. Shout it out, church. Shout it. Go on and scream it from the mountains. Go on and tell it to the masses. That he is God. Father, we just want to thank you for being our God. Lord, the ability we have to worship someone that's transcendent, yet so imminent, so close to us, so desirous of relationship. We praise you for it. Because of that, we can worship. Lord, just release us from those things that are troubling us to receive a full blessing today. And our world is tough, and there's people crying out that need for us to shout it from the mountains, not only verbally, but how we act in our character, so that they can see you, Father. Father, too, we, we pause to thank you for all those who are laboring, Lord, in the trenches, sharing the gospel. We praise you, and we thank you for them. Lord God, and we offer up not only our hearts and our minds to that effort, but Lord, with our, our finances, and we pray for this offering today. Help us to continue to worship you and all that we are in your son's name. Amen. I want you to just kind of take a moment to grab those communication cards. You'll find them in your bulletin. Um, I don't know if you noticed in the back panel of your bulletin is a list of praises. That's just an amazing thing to look at if you want to take a peek at those throughout the week. That's where they go. And just to take a quick look at that, it's an amazing thing to see all the things that we can praise our God for. Amen? Amen. So that is part of what that communication card is about. Maybe you're visiting with us today. We want to welcome you. Jot down your information there. Uh, and for all of us, let's just share a prayer request and a praise today.
as the band plays. Thank you.
team. It was great to hear them this morning, wasn't it? Give them, yeah, give them a hand. That was awesome. That was awesome. Good job. Hey, we're in the midst of our series, and I hope that that prayer and that music has sort of set your hearts ready for God's Word in this series as we're in the Lent season. We don't really ce celebrate Lent uh, in the traditional sense, but we know there, these are the days leading up to Easter, uh, Resurrection Sunday, and we're excited about that. And so we're uh, in the middle of this series on the power of the gospel and the power that God shows in revealing his son and the gospel to us. And before I get into the text, and, and this morning our text is Matthew uh, 9, uh, I think it's 16 to 25 or something like that. Let me look. Uh, 18 to 26. There we go. And um, I'm going to read uh, to you out of that text, and we're going to teach out of that text this morning, but but this is a text which is covered in all of the Gospels, or at least Matthew, Mark, uh, and Luke. And so we see Matthew, Mark, and Luke have different perspectives on this incident. So what I wanted to share with you this morning, I thought this was a good time to do this, is that we're going to read through the Gospel stories, but in harmony. In other words, we're going to read the Gospels, all three of them together, I will read that to you, and, and, I, and I want to put out a, a, a plug here. I don't even know if this book is still published, but it's called The Life of Christ in Stereo. If you're a person who likes to keep a, a small theological library in your house, this is a book you can't be without. This is a great book. There's another one by a gentleman named A.T. Robertson called The Harmony of the Gospels, which I use. It's a little bit more technical, but this is a great book for reading through the Gospels where they sort of intersect, and it gives you the perspective of the writers. And people have asked me, the reason I share that is because people have asked me, well, why do we have four Gospels? Why isn't there just one Gospel? Why couldn't 
just one person's story be enough? But it really is great to hear the perspective of the, of the disciples, the different perspective each one has as they watch Jesus' ministry. And, and what they recorded, what was in their mind, what stuck out to them as they recorded it. And so this morning as we look through, go ahead and find Matthew 9, stick your finger there, and then go ahead and stand up, and we're going to read through all three of the Gospels. If you've got your Bible there, you can just stick your finger, but we'll have on the screen, I believe, the text of all three. Right, Kath? And this is, this is where we begin. It actually begins in Luke chapter 8, verse uh, 40, and we'll go through all the verses. You can just follow it on the screen there, and I'll read through it. Now, when Jesus returned, the crowd welcomed him, for they were all waiting for him. While he was saying these things to them, behold, a ruler came in and knelt before him, saying, My daughter has just died, but come and lay your hand on her, and she will live. And who had suffered much under many physicians, and had spent all that she had, and was no better, and she grew worse. Uh, Matthew 9, 21, For she, had to herself, it, she said to herself, If only I touch his garment, I will be made well. And immediately the flow of blood dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of the disease. And Jesus said, Who was it that touched me? And when all denied it, Peter said, Master, the, the crowds around you are pressing in on you. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed uh, of your diseases. While, she, while he was still speaking, someone from the ruler's house came and said, don't worry, you're, you're, don't bother the master anymore, your daughter has died. They came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and Jesus saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. And when Jesus came to the ruler's house and saw the flute players and the crowd making a commotion, uh, taking by her by the hand, he said to her, Talitha Kumai, which means, little girl, I say to you, arise. And her parents were amazed, and he charged them to tell no one what had happened. And the, but the report of this went out through all of the district. Father, speak to us today through your word and teach us of the great power of the gospel, and the power that came in your son Jesus. Amen. Go ahead and have a seat. So you see there are two incidences that are occurring. One is a, a man comes and shares with Jesus that his daughter is ill. She needs to be healed. She's almost, she's on death's doorstep. As he's making his way to this person's home, another woman in the crowd reaches out and touches his, his garment for healing. Jesus heals her, then continues on to the home of the leader. He gets there and he discovers that the girl they had supposed had died he said, was just sleeping. Now, uh, in, in the actual Greek, the word kaitheudo is, um, is the euphemism for death. It means sleep, but it's sort of a euphemism for death. So the reality is she was dead. She had died in the meantime. And so Jesus came to her, told her to arise, and, and raised her from the dead. There are cases of resurrections in the Gospels uh, other than this one, as you know, uh, Jesus uh, raised Lazarus from the dead, and there are others. And here we have this case where he came unto this young girl, and he raised her from the dead. So in this portion of Scripture that we're going to look at today, chapter 9, 18 to 26, what we will see is uh, Matthew's perspective on all of this. Uh, some of the things you'll recognize were added in there from, from Luke and from uh, Mark's Gospels. But here we see uh, this uh, passage just from Matthew's perspective, and what he thought was important. Uh, Matthew, I should tell you, was writing uh, his gospel to the Jewish people, and he really wanted the Jewish people to understand who Jesus was. And so his perspective is a little bit different than everybody else's, but that was his perspective. And so Matthew is reading this passage, or writing this passage to us, and as we read it, uh, we want to uh, identify ourselves in this passage, see the, the big point, the main thing, and then, and then apply it to ourselves. We want to see what's, what's happening here and then apply it to uh, our lives. Now, we have been in this, is the third week we've talked about these things, and, and you're probably starting to see a pattern here, but the first two previous messages, one, the first one was set on the centurion who asked Jesus to come and heal his servant. Last week, we talked about the friends who brought the paralyzed man to Jesus and set him before Jesus uh, and, and asked him for uh, healing and bringing the paralyzed man you know, back to 
health. And we see the debate that Jesus has there with the people and the leaders over what's more important, being able to heal somebody or being able to forgive their sins. And I think the power of the gospel there is really demonstrated in that both of those things are important, right? It's great when Jesus brings about a miracle of healing. We see that happen all the time. But it's even greater because Jesus is the only one who can say, uh, young man, your sins are forgiven. Right? I can't say that to you. Uh, nobody can say that to you, but Jesus can say that to you. So as we start to look at the, uh, the differences here in this particular passage where we get a twofer, uh, we get to see the differences between uh, the two. And you'll notice the number 12 comes up a lot. I'm not really big into numerology, but I don't know if it was a, a mem- something used as a memorization tool for the people so that they would remember this as Jesus' teaching, or if there's something significant in the number 12 here. But as you look at the passage in chapter 9, starting with verse uh, 16, 18, and going forward from there, what we see happening here is t- a two for healing but they have some things in common, and they have some things that are, that are different. I'm going to read to you the passage again. Listen carefully. While he was saying these things to them, behold, a ruler came in and knelt before him, saying, My daughter has just died, but come and lay your hand on her, and, he, and she shall live. And Jesus rose and followed him with his disciples. And behold, a woman who had suffered from a discharge of blood for 12 years came up behind him and touched the fringe of his garment. For she said to herself, if only I touch his garment, I'll be made well. And Jesus turned and seeing her said, take heart, daughter, your faith has made you well. And instantly the woman was made well. And when Jesus came into the ruler's house and saw the flute players and the crowd making a commotion, he said, go away, for the girl is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. But when the crowd had been put outside, he went in and took her by the hand, and the girl arose, and the report of this went out through all the district. <clears throat> You'll notice things are a little bit different there than when we read all of the Gospels put together. One of the things is, in this passage, it does not mention who the leader is. It just says, a leader, a ruler in the synagogue came in, and his name in the other Gospels is given to us. His name is Jairus. And so it's Jairus who comes and asks Jesus to heal his daughter. So what do we see in these two uh, women that are that's different and then that are the same? Well, first of all, um, we see 12 years of, of, of joy, right? A young girl, she lives to be 12 years old. Uh, if you've ever raised kids, you know they only get worse as they get older, so uh, that's not true. But... But those first 12 years, parents cherish, as you can imagine, and she's probably a carefree young lady, and and she's living her life those first 12 years with joy. Then you see the woman contrasted with that who has had this sickness, this issue of blood for 12 years, 12 years of pain. And we see these contrasted in Mark and Matthew in in the description of this passage, but 12 years. One comes boldly to Jesus, right? The father comes and says, come heal my daughter, come heal my daughter. One comes up from behind. Sneaks up on Jesus, barely touches his garment. One is highly respectable. He's a leader, Jairus. He helps in the synagogue, the local synagogue. One is ceremonially unclean, right? We have a woman who is ceremonially unclean. One has uh, to wait for the miracle. She waits in her home. As As those around her said, she has passed away physically. She's died. She's waiting for Jesus to come. One is clean and and healed, I should say, uh, immediately. Uh, On the spot, Jesus heals her. Um, There are other contrasts that we see uh, in in the Gospels here. One is that um, one was healed, you know, publicly, and one was healed behind closed doors. I think that's significant. Jesus did what needed to be done, where it needed to be done, when it needed to be done. But there were similarities. Both came with confidence. Now, not, not that they had confidence that they would have a miracle performed, but yet they had confidence that Jesus could do it. The family of the young girl knew he could do it, and the woman who chased him in the crowd knew that he could do it. Both needed what only Jesus could provide, right? Doctors couldn't heal the young woman. In fact, she died before they got there. And on the other hand, the woman had been seeking help for 12 years and could not find help and healing anywhere It could only come from Jesus. The bottom line is for us, before we even get into our outline really, is is to consider that those who are at the top 
not think that their prosperity or their popularity or their blessing um, excludes them from needing Jesus. Right? We have people like that around us. Maybe you're one. I don't want to point out anybody, but maybe you're one who says, you know what, life's going pretty good. Why do I need Jesus? Believe it or not, there are folks out there that are like that. <clears throat> and then there are truth, too, for those of us at the bottom. Don't think that your desperation or your depravity, uh, your sin, excludes you from Jesus reaching you. We have those out there as well. I'm not good enough. Jesus could never love me. And we struggle, most of us, on a fine line between those two. In our life, we go through times of, I don't need Jesus, things are going well, and I need Jesus more than ever, things are going horribly. We walk a fine line between those things. I think it was sort of exemplified here with Paul this morning. You could see, you could sense the passion in his prayer. You could see that same sort of passion probably in this passage for the young girl's parents or for the woman who has the, the blood issue and she's chasing after Jesus. There's this passion that, that I'm not quite good enough. What's going on? Why isn't God working in me? If I could just get an answer to this. Right? And, and we struggle, most of us, in our life with feeling very content in the Lord and very uh, uh, okay with who we are and where we are. And, and then just a short step away is that, that cry of desperation. That feeling of, I, I don't know what's going on, but I, I don't sense that I'm going to find an answer here. I don't sense that, the, that I can reach out and touch God. He's very distant from me right now. And I am struggling. I'm struggling. Here we see it in the physical sense, represented in these, these two healings that are taking place that we have seen in this passage. But I want to jump into the outline very briefly with you and, and share with you what's going on. Now, what we see in happening in the, the life of this woman who is chasing Jesus and what we see happening in the, in the life of the family of this 12-year-old girl is, is desperation. We've all felt desperation before. So as we approach this, what we look at here is, number one, after 12 years of living, the girl's lost her life. 12 years. Imagine what it would be like to lose your life or to lose someone after 12 years. I know there are some in our congregation who have felt that pain, who know that feeling. Uh, a, a child, a grandchild, or somebody close to you, and they're born and they die within days or maybe within a year. Or some who live a little longer. And there is no way that I can even convey uh, my sense of, of hope for you in the midst of that kind of grief, right? I mean, that is a horrible, horrible type of grief that really I believe only God can bring a healing to and amending to because it is so, so difficult. But at the same time, what I can say is I offer the same sort of hope that we see these families looking for here in this passage, the, the hope of Christ Jesus, to bring about healing in one way or another. Here we see this young girl that dies after 12 years. What does that teach us? Well, first of all, it teaches us death is inevitable. There are horrible consequences for living in a fallen world, and that's where we live. It's a fallen world. And the Bible tells us right up front, because it's a fallen world, sin has entered in. And because of sin, there is death. There's nothing we can do about that. Physical death happens. It's a horrible consequence. A word and a hand from Jesus reverses the curse of death and brings life. There's only one thing that can happen that is a positive in all of that death is that Jesus can bring life out of it. Not your dad, not your, your granddad, not your mom, not your best buddy, not your spouse. Jesus brings great hope in the midst of death. I've heard somebody say before, you know, uh, birth happens and the rest of it is all leading to death, right? Uh, we, our whole existence is leading to death. It, it, it's the only thing that affects one out of every one of us. It's death. And we live with that struggle, don't we? We live with that struggle, knowing that our life is terminal. No matter how old we get, uh, time always wins, it seems. And so... Here we see a, a word and a hand from Jesus that can reverse the effects of death. And thirdly, physical death still occurs, but the Lord Jesus died and rose to bring life. 
That's where we're headed towards this Resurrection Sunday. That's why we're so excited about Easter. That's why Christians love Easter. We love Christmas, right? We love the coming of our little baby Jesus. We all love baby Jesus. But Easter, that was a decision God made in eternity past. And, and Jesus comes, and he goes to the cross for me, and as that realization comes about in my life, I go, wow, Jesus died for me, not, not just for you, as I stand up here and say, not just for you, but for Tom and you. <laughs> Toss you in there, I suppose. But for Tom. And, I, and that reality of that hits, and I go, wow, he came so that I could have relationship with the Father. And that that relationship through Christ brings about an eternal life that doesn't end at 60 or 70 or 80 years, but brings me into an eternity in the presence of God. How glorious is that? And Jesus did that. And so we see that even in the life of a 12-year-old, and, and lives can be cut short, much shorter than 12 we see that Jesus can bring about a healing from the worst disease ever, death, right? He doesn't say wear a mask. He doesn't say isolate. He says, look, accept my grace. Understand that I came for you. Believe in me, and you will have life. That's pretty tremendous. So we look at this young girl's life, as tragic as the, the story is, we see that Jesus comes, he heals her, and he brings life back to uh, this household. We see that Jesus has this power over, um, over death. Romans 5.21 says this, so that, as sin is, so that as sin reigned in death, Grace might also reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. He has power over death. That is amazing. We uh, can have power over lots of things, can't we? We've, we? We live in a very technological age, and you and I have power over lots of things, but you know the one thing we don't have power over is death. And this lesson of this young girl teaches us that Jesus has the power over death. Are you a beneficiary of his power over death? Secondly, we, we see in this passage the woman who chases him in the crowd, and she's coming after him, and after 12 years of, of bleeding for her, all hope is gone. There's one hope left, and that is Jesus. There's no power in the, the hem of cloth that Jesus was wearing. There's, you know, faith in, in Jesus gives eternal hope, and Jesus bled all of his life's blood in order to give us that same eternal hope. What do we see in this passage of this woman? I, I, I don't know why I identify with her, but I really um, I like this story uh, more than, than many. But we see in her this desire, maybe, maybe that's what I identify with, that constant chase Right? She sees Jesus coming into town with the crowd, and she begins to move with the crowd. She makes her way through the crowd, and she gets to Jesus. Now notice, I'm going to take a little sidebar here. Notice two weeks ago when we talked about the centurion coming for Jesus. What did he do? He made his way through the crowd, and he got right in front of Jesus. Right? He could have a conversation. Come, heal my servant. The next week, we talked about the friends who brought the paralyzed man on, the, on his mat or on his cot, right? And they bring him. Where did they take him? Did they follow the crowd and shout from the sidelines? No. They took him right to Jesus, right in front of Jesus. They stopped. And they said, can you heal our friend? This man needs healing. Can you do it? This week, we see the same thing with the, the, the Jairus, the leader of the synagogue, right? He, he comes right to Jesus. He says, come heal my daughter. What is common here? They're all willing to get through the crowd, to make their way. It might be tough for some of them, right? But they're going to make their way through that big crowd until they get right in front of Jesus and they say, I need you. For us, it's the same thing. We've got to make our way through the crowd. We've got to find our way to Jesus and say, I need you, Jesus. I can't just stand from the side and say, hey, if you see me, you know, wave. We've all been to parades before where we sit on the sidewalk and watch the parade go by. These people were not willing to let the parade go by. 
But why I identify with this woman is because she was part of that crowd, and she chased Jesus. And all she wanted to do was just touch his garment. She didn't want to make any big profession in front of him. She didn't want to stop the crowd. She didn't want to halt the parade, if you will. She just knew that if she got close, something would happen. I was uh, at the parade here in Albany a few years ago, and we were sitting across the street from, from friends, and I wanted to visit with all of them. And so I'm sitting there with, with friends, and we're watching, and the parade's going by, and there was a little bit of a break, and I tried to get across, but the parade doesn't stop, right? And so as I'm going, they're coming, and I'm going, and they're coming, and pretty soon I'm weaving my way through trombone players, <laughs> drummers, to get to the other side. Now, you might say, you're an idiot, Tom. I, said, I agree with that. But I, I, I wanted to get to the other side. And it's hard to get through a parade. Unless you're quick on your feet, it's tough. And so here's this woman who is chasing Jesus for, for all, the only hope that she has. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen a prayer shawl. Uh, the Jewish people call it a tallet. Did, were we able to get a picture of that? Okay. Well, you've seen them. They're white with blue stripes, and they kind of hang across the neck. They've been around for centuries, and Jesus probably wore one. The reality is, uh, for the Jewish people, in the book of Deuteronomy, there's a number of promises. It's a whole other sermon, but the idea is that they wear this prayer shawl, and on the corner of this tallet prayer shawl, they have what are called seat seats. And what those are is long pieces of thread that dangle off the corners of the prayer shawl. And they're wrapped tightly 39 times. Don't ask me why. I, I, don't, I don't know yet. I could find out for you. But they're wrapped 39 times, and they dangle. And what we see here in this passage is this woman reaches out and touches one of those. She touches one of the seat seats that's hanging off of the tallet that Jesus is wearing. So what, what this woman is trying to do is just touch God, right? I think maybe that's why I relate. Maybe you can relate too. Maybe you're in that constant chase. And it was a chase until you were able to, to find him and trust him as your Lord and Savior. But the chase doesn't end, right? The chase continues. I want to be like Jesus. I want to do what Jesus did. I want to follow Jesus closely. Maybe that's where you are. But I guarantee you there are some friends of yours probably who see Jesus in a distance as their only hope and they are chasing after Jesus and they're not there yet. When I was a kid, I used to, uh, Saturday mornings, I used to watch roller derby. How many of you watch roller derby? <laughs> no, are you kidding me? No roller derby? you got to be kidding me. This is Albany. There's no roller derby fans here. How about big time wrestling? Oh, uh, more of those. I think you're just afraid to admit it. Well, good. That gives me a chance to explain it even more. So in roller derby, they've got this person who's got to circle the, 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 the arena there where they're skating, and they've got to pass all the other team, right? And if they pass all the other team, they get a point for every person they pass. And so as skaters are coming, people on their own team will grab them from behind. You've seen this. They grab them from behind, and they sling them. So they're going really fast. And those People are going really fast around to try to catch and, and get points. You and I have the job, right? This, it's roller derby Christianity. Here we go. We have the opportunity to grab friends. That's our job. Grab friends and sing them right at Jesus. We get to swing them as hard so that, they, so that they, on their journey of chasing Jesus, get a little help from us. You know, it's amazing how God touches people in different places in different ways. But he has left us with the responsibility of helping those who can't get to him to get to him. That's our job. That's why we're here. He could have easily taken us right to heaven as soon as we made a commitment to Christ. But he left us here to do ministry for those who don't know him. And so we get to grab them, and, and maybe it's not quite that simple, but we get to help get them to Jesus. That's our job. I, I look back on the story, and I think all the people who are crowding around Jesus, trying to touch him or, or see him, what does he look like, what kind of a religion, what does he say, what does his accent sound like, you know, because he traveled a little bit, people wanted to know who he was, but I wonder how many people she had to battle her way past who were not helping her at all, but he was the last hope she had, and so she is moving towards Jesus with the, with the faintest hope of just touching him, touching his garment. 
We see the power of Jesus in the life of this woman as she, she reaches out to touch his garment. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 says this, If in Christ we hope in this life only, then we are of all people most to be pitied. You see, when she was reaching out for Jesus, she wanted an immediate healing. She wanted to be physically healed. I would have too. You probably would have too in the same situation. But she was going to Jesus because she knew he was the man of God. She may have understood what so many didn't, that he was God. She may have been reaching out to him not just for that physical healing. Probably that was preeminent in her mind. But she did it because she knew he could do it. When we go to Jesus, it's not just to live a better life here, uh, to have good, trustworthy friends in the church here, uh, to live a, a, what could be considered a, a morally good life here. But we reach out to Jesus because of this horrible thing called death, and Jesus has power over death. So she knew he could heal her, but she also knew this, this man may heal me for eternity. Maybe she didn't think that far. But for those of us today, we can easily say, I want to touch the hymn of Jesus, just the hymn, because I know that's enough to heal. And I know this is the man who can heal death. Nobody else can do it, but Jesus can do it. So after 12 years of bleeding and her issue, all hope was gone, but she reached out and touched the hymn. That those two stories bring us to that that bottom line of faith, that faith is the instrument of God by which he brings about life, and faith is God-given. Um, it's God-given trust in the worthy object of our faith. That's Jesus. The worthy object of our faith, that's Jesus. When I think about faith, you know, it's, it's one of those questions that people often have. Where do I, where do I get my faith, Pastor? Where, how can I have more faith? Where does faith come from? Well, I usually respond with, well, when you came to Christ as a child or a teenager or as an adult, where did you get that faith? Where did you get your faith to sort of step forward to take a step and, and ask Christ for forgiveness and make him your Lord and your Savior? Where did that come from? And they'll usually respond with, I don't know. And that leads us to that question, where does faith come from? Well, faith comes from God. It's a God-given gift. Believe it or not, when, when God gives you faith, it's, it's sort of like giving you salvation. You know, when we think of salvation, we think of it as a gift. God's given me the wonderful gift of salvation. How did it happen? Well, he supplied me with the faith to take a step and say, okay, I can do this. And it's a real interesting cooperation that we see going on here. The sovereignty of God, that no one should die, that all should love him and, through his son, Jesus Christ. The sovereignty of God. And then the will of man. What do I want? What do I need? How can I have this great gift? And it comes from God. And we see in his word, faith comes from hearing and hearing from the word of God. In almost every case, I would say every case, people who have come to Christ have heard the word of God. Back in the early part of the 20th century, early 19 aughts, you know, we were sending out missionaries all around the world. And one of their battle cries was, you know, the word of God, the word of God. We've got to get the word of God to the nations. Well, that battle cry is still happening today. We see missionaries going out all around the world to get the word of God out to people. They use wonderful different tools than they used back in the 1900s, but they're tr still trying to get the gospel into people's hands. Why is that? Because we all know, if you're in ministry, that faith comes from hearing and hearing by the Word of God. If I can get you the Word of God, then that will give you, in some sense, faith. Maybe not today, maybe not. It might be tomorrow, right? But it will give you faith to say, okay, I'm going to take that step of faith and surrender to Jesus. Nobody's going to surrender if all we do is tell stories or mention the name of Jesus. But when you share the gospel, you get the word of God into people's hands. They come to a, a, a precipice, if you will, where they take a step of faith. Because faith comes from hearing that very word of God. For us, it's significant that we share the word of God with people around us. That we build into their lives that we tell them about Jesus, but that we also share Scripture with them. 
that we talk about God's word. Because that's where they're going to get the faith to say, ah, now is the time. I need Jesus. When I celebrate uh, Easter, on uh, Easter Sunday morning, Resurrection Sunday, I, I'm always amazed at, at the story of the resurrection and all of that. And, and as, as you share that with people, people come to an understanding of who Jesus is. It's a wonderful thing. And so, so many people love to hear that story, but we don't necessarily act on it. Here we have a story, two stories really today of the younger woman and the older the older woman, and, and we see that we need to share these kinds of stories with people around us, and that type of story will bring about faith in people's life. It's, it's not simple. I, I don't get to push a button uh, and decide if, if what I share gets them uh, to make a decision. That's up to God and the Holy Spirit, but I can be there. I can be present in that process, and I encourage you to be present in that process. What we see happening here is... Um, Two cases of the power of the gospel being more powerful than death. What a tremendous story of victory. Tremendous story of victory. Before I pray to close, I want you to consider where do you stand in that process? Are you, are you chasing Jesus because you want to be more like him? Are you chasing him because you just want to touch his garment and be healed and, and know him? Or, or, are you maybe not there yet? Let's examine our hearts. Father, we come to you this morning. We just pray, Lord God, that you would teach us. By way of your word, you would teach us what it means to be people uh, who love you, who want to be in your kingdom, who want to have death conquered on our behalf. We don't want to be those who are left. We want to be those who are found righteous in you because of your son, Jesus. Father, we pray this morning as we examine our own hearts that we would be those who would believe the wonderful working power of the gospel and would share that power with others around us. And we want to be those who, who like the the father of the young girl and the family, we, we want to go on behalf of somebody and pray for them and ask you to meet them Right now, in in your mind's eye, as your eyes are closed, think about somebody you know who who needs the gospel, who may need some sort of emotional healing, maybe physical healing. But more than that, they need to know the conqueror of death. Let's pray for them. Father, we pray for those that we think of in our life, in our family, in our friends, who need the knowledge of Jesus. May we be the instrument that brings them to you. May we be conscious of the effort we make to bring them to you. And this morning you might be one of those people who needs to know Jesus carefully and understand that he's won over death on your behalf if he's your Lord and he's your Savior. If that be the case, then it's a simple prayer. It's, Lord... I need you. Please remove all of the things that have kept me from you, all of the the sin or the stuff in my life that has kept me from you. Come now, Lord Jesus. Live in my heart. Be my Lord. Sit on the throne that you rightly deserve. Be my Savior from this day forward. Lord, as we close our time together, we just pray that you would speak to our hearts that we might be like those seeking after Jesus in the crowd. In his name we pray. Amen. Would you go ahead and stand up again? We're going to sing another worship song before we close this morning.
Let me pray for us before we go. Father, thank you so much for the the hope that you give us in the gospel power of Jesus. Thank you for the hope that we have in overcoming death. We are not like those who wander without direction, but hope is for the forward-facing believer. Hope is our direction. Hope is not just heaven, but hope is here today. Father, we thank you for that tremendous hope, the hope that the young girl's family had, the the hope that the, the woman with the issue of blood had, the hope that they had in a Christ who could heal them. And we have that same hope, hope in a Christ who can bring us into eternity, overcoming death on our behalf. We are so grateful for that hope. Send us from here with... Uh, that glorious hope in mind that we might share it with others. We pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Okay, mask up and say hi to somebody in the lobby. We'll see you next time.